Hello to everybody, this is Pınar. I talk about F1 a lot on this channel. I talk in Turkish and sometimes in English, but I will try to do more English content this season. So I would love to have your support on that and with subscribing and liking the video, that will be great for me. And if you can just give me what you want to see in the channel on the comments, that will be great. But today's video, it's all about working in F1 which is the series I call that I do interview with people who work in F1 so we can ask them how they got into Formula One, how is their story started, how is the experience of working F1 is going and today's guest is very special person for me and he inspires me a lot with what he's doing right now in Formula One he is the chief communication officer of Aston Martin F1 team, Matt Bishop. I really enjoyed our talk with him. It, it was very inspiring and full of knowledge actually, full of experience. So hope you like it too. And I'm sorry if I made any mistakes because I was very excited for this interview. So forgive me already. And if you want to support my channel, please subscribe and like the video and let's go for the interview. Welcome to my channel, Matt, and it's a privilege for me to have you on this interview about working in Formula One in this environment. Uh, I'm doing this videos because most of the time, even though I don't work for Formula One, lots of people ask me how to get into Formula One. It's something like a magical to lots of people. So uh, I want to do this with different people from different departments and everything so uh, we can learn about more how the stories goes to get into Formula One. Uh, but firstly, I ask this to almost everyone. How was, what was your first F1 memory or motorsport memory? Because like, I, I believe that there should be some kind of passion behind to be able to work in Formula One this much over years. It's really demanding environment. And at least there, I believe there should be like some kind of love or passion behind it to be able to uh, work in Formula One. So what was your first moment that you can remember? Well, I'm 58, just about to become 59. So um, these first moments are quite a long time ago. But I will tell you one first moment, because it might be more interesting than some other first moments that I could remember. Uh, I mean, I could remember the first time I, I saw Autosport magazine, and I found that exciting. Uh, I could tell you the first time I saw a Formula One race on the television, and I found that interesting. But actually, before then, believe it or not, for most people these days, obviously, you watch and see a Formula One car or a Formula One race on television long before you get to go and see one uh, by visiting the circuit. But that wasn't the case for me because back in the day, all those years ago, uh, Formula One wasn't really on television. Uh, in, I live in the UK and the British Grand Prix was on and Monaco and sometimes Monza, but really, you know, the Dutch Grand Prix wasn't on in the UK, the United States Grand Prix wasn't on in the UK, the French Grand Prix wasn't on in the UK. Uh, but I remember being taken <clears throat> when I was 11, 11 and a half, by my stepfather to Brands Hatch for the 1974 British Grand Prix. And uh, the thing, I think the moment, you talked about a moment of passion, the moment of passion that I remember was walking into the circuit. And first of all, already, just hearing the engines revving, hearing the engines revving. And this was for the warm up. There used to be race morning warm ups uh, uh, until quite some uh, time after that, right through to this century, there were, there were race, warm, race morning warm ups. And they were exciting because it was early morning, there was dew on the ground, the air was clear, and the sound uh, uh, earth shattering. And I remember the very first car I saw, I was standing, sitting, but when I saw the car arrive, I stood. I was only small, remember, I was 11 and a half. But uh, I remember hearing the approach of 
uh, Formula One car and standing and seeing Clay Regazzoni's Ferrari burst into view over the hump in the hill at Clearways and rush past me under my nose through Clark Curve, the right-hander, and then power down the straight onto Paddock Hill Bend. And of course, that was a flat 12 engine in those days, three litre naturally aspirated. And I don't think I'd ever sat, heard anything so beautiful, but yet so violently, excitingly loud in my life before. And even if I still hear those engines now, not just Ferraris, but also uh, the Brabham Alpha, which would have appeared the, the following year, but one, uh, the Ligier Matra, the same, and of course, the good old Cosworth DFV still sounds fantastic, I think. So that's my first memory, the flash of red and the extraordinary sound of Clay Regazzoni's Ferrari at Brands Hatch in 1974. Yeah, so it was like uh, instant love at the first moment, I believe so. And I can remember my childhood memory going to Turkish Grand Prix for the first time in 2006. And I, I think I had a similar experience with seeing the Formula One cars first time live, hearing those engines roar. So it's definitely something different being on the circuit. And it's, it gives you some kind of different motivation to be in that environment. But it does. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's different. Even though with the new engines, it's still good experience to go to a Grand Prix. Absolutely. And of course, I would have been there at Istanbul Park in 2006. Uh, I remember it well. Great circuit, actually, by the way, and turn eight, a special, special turn with four APCs. Yeah, exactly. I, I love, I mean, it's beyond, beyond that I'm being a Turkish. I, I love the circuit as a fan. It's one of the greatest from the yes. latest designs, actually, uh, I think so. But uh, your career is amazing. Like I can't even, I, I'm not the person who to justify this or to say about it, but it's more than almost 30 years. It's crazy. I can imagine what went through in your career, uh, your psychological changes, your mental uh, strengths um, with all those uh, changing times, but how everything started. I'm wondering like, because have you planned out like I'm, I'm going to work in Formula One or it just happened in time or you just found your uh, passion, your wishes on the way? I am a very, very, very lucky boy. I am. Uh, so I didn't do particularly well at school. I was um, a clever boy, but I didn't work very hard. Uh, and so I didn't do very good in, in my exams didn't do very well in my, in my what we call O-levels and A-levels, now GCSEs and A-levels. Um, so I didn't get to go to university at that time. And I was, um, I suppose, disappointed in myself. Um, my parents were disappointed in me. And I began to do work. I had to earn a living. And although I'd never worked very hard at school, I did find that there was something about real work, if you want to call it that, that inspired me, even if I was doing a not very exciting or prestigious or well-paid job. And I did various jobs that were neither exciting nor well-paid nor prestigious. <clears throat> and one of them was working in betting shops, uh, bookmakers as we call them, um, in and around greyhound racing. What a strange thing, eh? But it was very popular in the UK in the 80s. Uh, I mean, in London alone, there were many, many, many greyhound racing tracks. Bear with me on this. You may wonder why I'm telling you this, but it comes relevant in a minute. Um, and they were, you know, over 450, 500 meters, uh, basically around a football pitch. So, for instance, Wembley Stadium, which is the most prestigious and exciting stadium in, in UK football, around the outside used to be a, 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 a greyhound track. And the football was rare, just England internationals and the FA Cup um, and so on, FA Cup final. But every Monday night, Wednesday night and Friday night, there would be greyhounds going around and very few people, a few hundred people would watch instead of the 90,000 who would watch the FA Cup final. So anyway, I began to work there and I was quite good at maths, quite good at quick reckoning of uh, settling uh, liabilities. So I began to work with the a, a 
trackside bookmaker called John Power. And I began to speak to some of the <clears throat> Greyhound people. And one of them was a man called Jim Kremin, who worked for the Racing Post newspaper. I think he may still do so. And he said to me, Matt, you can chat, you can talk, you've got uh, a good way of expressing yourself. Why don't you write something about Greyhound racing? So I did. And he was very kind to give me the opportunity. I was only in my early 20s. And I began to realize that, yes, I could write. And not only could I write, but I, I was quite an accurate technical writer from a grammatical and syntactical point of view. So that being the case, I became a sub-editor, correcting, checking, smoothing out, polishing the copy and the writing of other people, fact-checking too. And I did that on a freelance basis, and then I got a job doing that on Car Magazine. This is now 1990, early 90s. And from there, I suppose it was not such a big step to begin to write uh, road test reports, so I was writing about cars and going on launches, and the then editor, Gavin Green, still a friend, very good guy, uh, and I both shared an interest in motor racing and Formula One in particular, and he said, oh, I began to talk to him about, let's do a little bit more content, uh, Formula One, so we had Nigel Roebuck, the great Nigel Roebuck writing for us and others, and then I began to write the odd story myself, um, and go to the old Grand Prix myself. This is still early, early 90s. Uh, but that was me started, I suppose, me getting a foot in the door. And all I would say, because that story, that anecdote, uh, isn't very helpful to, to anybody watching this because it was all luck. And I can't recommend people to go and find a job in greyhound racing in the United Kingdom because <laughs> A, most of your... Uh, uh, watchers and listeners don't live in the United Kingdom, and B, there's no greyhound racing anymore. Uh, this is all ancient history, I realise that, I'm so old. <laughs> but, but, but I suppose the lesson that they can take from that is you never know where the opportunity will arise. So always, always say yes to opportunity. I have a maxim in life, if in doubt, say yes. So say yes to whatever opportunity and then when you get there optimize your contacts you know jim kremin probably doesn't remember me i remember him but uh, he was very important to me because he suggested that and i could have said oh no you're all, you're all right mate I, I, i'm not a writer i'm just doing the sums but actually it turned out i was and perhaps am so uh, that's my recommendation, is always try hard, always push, if in doubt, say yes, and if you do get any opportunity or networking, grab it with, with both hands. That's great, like, uh, while we are at the writing phase uh, of your life, I'm saying life because you're a writer, novel writer. Because I'm still alive. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I've got, I got your book when I came to Netherlands oh, because <laughs> it's easier for me. So I started and I, I love it so far. And I want to ask you, like, uh, this is more about the life. I mean, it's, yes. it's something that everyone can take some kind of lessons from it or experience or stuff like that. But about motorsport, have you ever considered writing something about motorsport as a novel, maybe? Because it's not something done so often i think i i read one with uh juice verse I, I i i i think there's one novel i know about formula one world but have you considered that well i haven't but never say never you, you know uh I, I don't know how long i will be working in formula one uh, i uh, intend to continue to do so for a while yet i'm 59 when are you when are you going to put this out uh when it's i think after christmas after christmas uh, well uh, by that uh, time i will be 59 <laughs> because my 59th birthday is 25th of december so christmas boy <laughs> uh, christmas boy christmas boy so by the time this is seen i'll be 59 so uh, but i intend to work for a little while longer uh if they will have me at aston martin and so far so good it was a building season we'll probably talk about that later i don't know but um Hopefully, if I am um, 
if my, my uh, health remains, going through to my 60s, 70s, maybe, who knows, if I'm lucky, 80s, I may be able to write and continue to write, and that would be nice. Uh, I've written, as you say, a novel, um, nothing to do with motorsport at all, nothing to do with Formula One at all. Um, the boy made the difference, and thank you very much for buying it, because even if you don't like it, your money will go to charity. It all goes to children's cancer charity, so I don't take any money from it. So please plug it to your, to your viewers. Yeah. <laughs> it's available on Amazon, Book Depository, and other uh, similar sellers. Uh, I will share the link below, by the way, so Perfect. you can all check. Perfect. And it's in, uh, it's in paperback and also Kindle, um, if you prefer to read novels on Kindle. Anyway, I've also written a book, uh, I ghost wrote a book um, for Emerson Fittipaldi. So it's called Emo, A Racer's Soul. And I wrote that about six or seven years ago with Emerson Fittipaldi, just a small book, a, a selected autobiography, not the whole life from beginning to end, but just in 12 chapters, I think I seem to remember, picking up on themes. But he was such a pleasure to work with because he's a brilliant guy, a fantastic driver, a legend, and of course, he remembers everything. Astonishing. If I asked him about the 1974 Dutch Grand Prix, he would remember immediately, you know, the race, the qualifying, his dice with Mike Halewood, by the way, I remember that too. And, um, but he'd also probably remember, you know, the tyre selection and uh, what Cosworth engine number he had and what he had for breakfast. So he's a great person to write a book with. So it was easy to write. And it's an OK book. If you think it is an OK book, I think it is. But I think that because of Emerson, not because of me. Now, you asked a question about novels to do with um, Formula One. <clears throat> I don't have one in mind. Never say never. But I'm slightly wary of novels that are based on real sport. I, I, I'm not quite sure that I've ever read a good one. Now, I'm going to find one. In my shelves behind me, I have many. This is a very rare book. Can you read it? it? Yeah. The, oh, Gramil, The Torello so, Tigers. It's actually a fictional novel written by Graham Hill. I don't know who wrote it for him. But, um, <laughs> hey, I bought it in a second-hand shop, and it still has this, um, oh my this God. little leaflet in it. But uh, it was, I think it was published... I spent it, I cost 40 pence. That's two fifths of a pound, about half a euro. And it was published in 1968. Um, I have that one, uh, but That's there are not cool. many about, there are not many, many about. And I'll tell you, you know, Damon Hill's dad is an absolute legend of our sport, but he's not a very good novelist. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's totally another skill if you ask me um, uh, I want to get the part that uh, again like your career is so long and you've seen I think the two of opposite sides like you've been in the press side with F1 racing now it's GP racing and later on uh, you start to work with McLaren and now with Aston Martin uh, which is totally another story with new team establishing as you mentioned before and this, this is more uh, about the communication side the PR side of a team so what's the main differences between being a press person or a PR person how the first in the sport and uh, if you want to answer of course which do you prefer to be in that they are two sides of the same coin uh, in, in order to do either, in order to be a journalist or editor in Formula One, or indeed in order to be a, a, a PR person, a comms person, you have to understand the media, pretty obviously. You have to understand the sport, of course, but you also have to understand the media. <clears throat> and in order to understand the media, you have to, I think, be a fan. You have to understand fans. Not all fans are the same, so I don't mean it in that sense, but you have to have a, a feeling for what it is to be a fan, whether you're a Dutch fan or a Turkish fan or, or a British fan or an you know, American fan or a Brazilian fan or a French fan or whatever. You have to have a, or an old fan or a young fan or a fan of the engines or a fan of the cars or a fan of the drivers or a fan of the strategies. 
uh, whatever it is, um, you have to have uh, a, a, an understanding of and a sympathy and empathy with that. Uh, you also have to be a storyteller. All of these things are absolutely key to both roles, to being a journalist or an editor on the one hand, or to being a PR person or a comms person on the other. Because let's say you have 20 minutes sitting one-to-one -one with Max Verstappen and you have your recording device sitting between you. Now, within reason, I say within reason because there are questions that he will not answer or doesn't want to explore. And there are other ones that he might be more willing to. And by the way, I realize it's very difficult to get one-to-one -one these days with a, with, a, with a driver or for a journalist, but it is still occasionally possible. But how you conduct those 20 minutes is absolutely key. Uh, and more key in a sense to how you then sit down to write. So I think you have to be uh, intrepid yet confidence inspiring. You have to be able to listen to the driver's answers. You might think that's a surprising thing to advise, but I think it's rare. Often you see a journalist who ask a driver a question and he's a bit nervous. He or she is a bit nervous, the journalist often. So they have their list of questions, mistake, never take a list of questions. Uh, rehearse in your minds, it, it, you know, the five or six themes that you want to um, explore and, and rehearse those carefully and prepare carefully and make sure you have them front of mind and do some study. But don't sit with a list in front. First of all, it annoys the driver, makes the driver think this is gonna be boring. Secondly, I see it so many times. When the driver is trying to give an interesting answer, the journalist offers this. The top of the head, which in my case is particularly <laughs> unsightly, and looking down at the next question. And then the driver says something fascinating, which in normal conversation, the journalist should pick up on and explore. But instead the driver hasn't heard because he, sorry, the, the journalist hasn't heard because he or he, she is thinking, it's okay, I've got this taped, I can listen later, it's recording. But in fact, then explores a completely new and often more boring uh, idea. So let's say, here's a purely hypothetical example. If Max Verstappen said, and this is purely hypothetical, if he said, actually, I don't think Atten Senna was very quick. Now, straight away, this is hypothetical. Straight away, the journalist should explore this fascinating new avenue. Instead of which, he would say, who do you consider, other than Lewis Hamilton, to be your biggest rival in Formula One today? And then Max Verstappen said, oh, for goodness sake. <sighs> um, probably, uh, how long is this interview? <laughs> That's what happens. So you have to listen. You have to be intrepid yet open, obviously courteous and polite and well prepared. But by the same token, to work well in comms, you have to think of ideas, think of um, opportunities for journalists. So you have to think like a journalist because you have to put forward to that journalist, not just an opportunity to interview, but a feature idea sometimes uh, or something that um, resonates with a particular theme of the day or perhaps even an anniversary you know i like anniversaries on this day this happened and that yeah happened. i love your anniversary tweets between <laughs> i know it's a bit nerdy a bit of a train spotter thing but it, yeah. I, I love the history of the sport yeah. and i find a nice way to record the history of the sport yeah i think it's it's nice because like uh in right now there are lots of new funds coming to sport and there are fans like me. I'm, I'm watching Formula One more than 16 years, but still, I don't know the history so much. I try to learn and read, but this kind of tidbits, it's just a little tidbit maybe to you, but for me, it's a new knowledge, maybe a new driver or new Grand Prix that happened somewhere about the driver. So it's really important for me and it's really special to well, think that you do. I enjoy doing it and I enjoy researching little details, little certain details. And occasionally, if I record the birth date or indeed the death date of a driver who, you know, raced 60 years ago, um, 
sometimes I get a DM uh, on Twitter from his granddaughter saying, oh, I haven't read about my granddad for so long. I printed out your tweet and I showed it to my mum and she cried with happiness. So, you know, those things are very rewarding. Anyway, going back to your question, going back to your question, I would say that uh, all those things, those skills, those um, affinity with storytelling and a fan's uh, uh, position uh, or outlook are very important for both uh, journalist and editor on the one side and um, a PR person or comms person on the other side. I'd say two other things. If I really am honest, I think that being a PR or comms person is a more difficult job uh, because there's more to balance. You know, in a sense, for a journalist, you, you of course you have to try hard to get your access. Of course you do your research. Of course you have to work hard strategically thinking, try to work out if he says that what is actually happening. And there are some very good news gatherers who think like that. But you have to do all of that as a comms or PR person, but you also have to work with and sometimes against, it has to be said, uh, the machine of the Formula One team, because quite naturally, not everybody senior in the Formula One team is prioritizing the media. They're prioritizing making the car go faster, uh, as they should do. So you have to work with the team um, it, it, to try to find a way of optimizing the comms, uh, which is not always everybody's um, uh, priority. And that goes across all the teams. That's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is that mistakes are more savagely punished if you're working in comms or PR because you, you write a story saying, uh, I think uh, Max Verstappen is going to join Mercedes. And if he does, you look like a hero. And if he doesn't, because people did write that many years ago and quite consistently, as you know, if he doesn't, people don't endlessly remind you of your failing. Whereas as a comms or PR person, you're not just acting on behalf of yourself, you're acting on behalf of a company with hundreds of people and a very big brand often. In my case, every job I've ever had in Formula One comms, whether it's McLaren or Aston Martin, representing a very big brand, jeopardy is considerable for getting it wrong. And that concentrates your mind. You ask me which is more fun, journalism. Now, I, I don't mean that in any way to criticize uh, any of the jobs I've had for teams, they're fantastic but they're too hard to simply be fun. Journalism is fun. I'm not saying you don't work hard. I'm not saying uh, there aren't great journalists who have achieved fantastic uh, 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 um, stories, news reports, uh, written books and so on, far greater than I ever could. I completely concede that. But you could call journalism fun. You couldn't call um, working as a director for a Formula One team against all the stresses and strains, you couldn't quite call it fun. Yeah, uh, I want to ask uh, about like uh, you mentioned like that hypothetical story about the Verstappen when he gets bored because of the questions and he just like, oh, then he gets a label uh, based on from the press or fans. It's, I think it's easier to get a label in these days in the world of Formula One, maybe because of social media, you have to deep dive for that. But is it harder nowadays? Like uh, something happened after Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, there's one video of Total Wolf leaked or go out. Uh, I don't know how to phrase that. But then later on, it got something different. But I think it was normal. And after uh, like 22 races season long, which was the longest of Formula One history, and it will be longer next year. So the stress is high, the work is higher. And yeah, you get, you need your time. I, I think you guys need your time also outside of Formula One. So is it harder nowadays to keep everything in place? Uh, because there are some restrictions still for Formula One, even though the they opened the social media door. Uh, there's strict rules. So what do you think about it? So <clears throat> I only gave Max Verstappen as an example. Um, it could have been Lewis Hamilton or Charles Leclerc or Carlos Sainz or anyone else or Sebastian Vettel or Lance Stroll. Um, I, I just gave that as an example. Um, and also, it's always been hard, you, you know, 
what I've described, obviously I used to be a journalist some years ago. I stopped being a journalist in 2007, at the end of 2007 when I joined McLaren. But um, there were always before then and long before then, there were drivers who were more collaborative and cooperative. Even going back to the 70s, 1970s, there used to be a prize given out by the journalists called Prix Orange, which was for the driver most um, collaborative and cooperative with the press, and Prix Citron for the least. And I think Mario Andretti often won the Orange for being the most uh, collaborative. And I think Jody Schechter at least sometimes won the Prix Citron for being the least. But um, so that issue has always been around, the, the dialogue and the dynamic between driver and journalist. Um, I think it is more difficult these days because I talk about media narratives or news narratives. And if you had a race on the television, live broadcast, I'm talking about, let's say, the late, eight, late 70s, early 80s, late 80s, early 90s. And then the next thing that happened was a newspaper report. And the next thing that happened after that was a weekly report in a weekly magazine. That was about it. The news narrative was slow. Now, with social media, and as you say, as we saw this uh, at the very last race, Abu Dhabi 2021, the news narrative doesn't change and evolve by the day. It changes and evolves by the minute, by the minute. And if you're a journalist trying to get on top of the media narrative to make sure that you are both leading it and reflecting it, because good journalists do both, then you have to be aware of that evolution, ongoing, never ending evolution. And absolutely, if you're one of the comms people involved. So in this case, if you were working as a comms person for the Mercedes team or the Red Bull team, you have to be absolutely aware of that ongoing evolution and be aware of it. And indeed, sometimes, yes, lead it or mold it or influence it uh, in, in the way that you wish it to be done. So it's never ending and you can't go to sleep. Uh, going to sleep is a risk. Um, and you have to be always on it. You know, I mean, uh, I can't really watch a film at home anymore without constantly reaching out for the phone. And, you know, I find it hard to concentrate. That's because you have to be on it. You never know what's going to appear. The world is a 24 hour, um, uh, uh, obviously, because when somebody's asleep in the Netherlands, they're awake in China and vice versa. And, they can tweet or post anything anytime. Yeah, it's it's seven for twenty four hours living environment now, and I think it's hard for everyone because I read like lots of fans, even fans after the final race, they were like, "I'm done with social media for a while. I don't want to be around." So it's a tough job uh, out there. But uh, I, I think it is, and I will just add one thing to that. Yeah. I mean, I I. I Obviously, I work uh, uh, with very good colleagues at Aston Martin who run all our <clears throat> um, social media accounts, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but also now TikTok and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and it's a busy, difficult job. And again, mistakes can be punished. And there is jeopardy there because you, they are representing Aston Martin as an important brand. And I work with them. You know, and, and uh, I think it's very important that the comms director or chief comms officer, whatever you call, uh, works well with these people and uh, collaboratively with these people in, in order to make sure that they are fully apprised of what the, uh, the ongoing narrative ought to be, at least what we think it ought to be from our team point of view. So I think that is very difficult and also difficult for fans. You know, if you're a Verstappen fan, and you write something about Verstappen, you probably know that Hamilton fans will pile on. If you're a Hamilton fan and you write something positive about Hamilton, you probably know that Verstappen fans will pile on. And I've tried very hard myself because everybody's human. We get annoyed. 
people post things to me that, that annoy me. I mean, I'm a gay man. If I've sometimes stood up for uh, LGBTQ plus people um, in the world and in sport, and in fact, I'm a founder ambassador of Racing Pride, and then I get people telling me, oh, very good, yes. Um, then I get people telling me that uh, <clears throat> I'm disgusting. You know, even though I'm an old man, it still has the power to, um, to offend and to, and to upset. And I try very hard to respond politely. I may well block them, I may well report them, but if I, uh, I respond, I respond politely with the obvious exception of Boris Johnson, um, to whom there is no need to be polite at all. Yeah, that's the part that I want to talk about most, actually, because you are one of the few people I know that who is really loud about uh, human rights, I will say. That's the, I think that should be the term. Uh, and mm. as a Turkish person and as a woman, uh, it's, it's a tough job. It's a tough environment to be in the motorsport because it's a boys club in the end and it's it it feels like sometimes it belongs to some kind of uh cultures and it's changing i feel it's changing because the world is changing at least there are fights everywhere for this kind of rights but uh formula one launched we race as one as you obviously know and do you think the sport is changing Uh, about that, uh, about that side for different groups, different uh, people from uh, different beliefs, sexual choices or beings, uh, whatever you call, uh, like, uh, because like still uh, there are diversity talking, but a- as I, I don't see lots of action from it. Uh, so- it yeah. So Rome wasn't built in a day, is a famous phrase. And I think we have to bear that in mind. I applaud and support We Race As One, hashtag We Race As One, which is a Formula One um, initiative, as you know. But it is a hashtag. And I think there is a danger. There is a danger, particularly with the power of social media, that organizations, rights holders, companies, bodies, individuals, celebrities, whoever, inaugurate a hashtag, and then there is a danger of thinking, right, the job is done. My hashtag is trending, um, good, I've done a good thing. And by the way, they have done a good thing. They have done a good thing because the alternative is to do nothing and doing nothing is worse than doing something. <clears throat> But I think I call that talking the talk. A hashtag is equivalent of talking the talk. But what you have to do is walk the walk. So, for instance, at Aston Martin, well, no, I'll start with Racing Pride. Um, in 2019, I was one of a very small team of people who inaugurated Racing Pride in conjunction with Stonewall, which is a very well-known and very good LGBTQ plus charity. And the reason we did that is we thought even in 2021 or 2019, as it was then when we inaugurated it, uh, there is still need for LGBTQ plus people of all ages and colors um, and abilities and denominations and religions and geographies and uh, uh, different situations in which they interact with the sport, the global sport, motorsport there's still a need for LGBTQ plus people to be assisted. Whether it is a 13-year-old go-kart driver, um, and perhaps he or she or they don't know what they are really doing in terms of gender or sexuality, but they deserve to have a chance to race carts if they want to. So they ought to be assisted and supported. Or if it's a straight boy, which is a heterosexual boy, which is the most common through history and still now in terms of people who interact uh, with motorsport and indeed uh, start off racing as go-kart racers, a straight boy, even then he should not be um, exposed to the kind of language which normalizes saying something like, 
instead of you drove really bad today, you drove really gay today. Now, if you have a 13 year old who is told that, he may not be personally offended. He may know that he's straight already, 13, why not? Um, he may know exactly what he, wa what he wants to do, <laughs> but, um, but he ought not to have that normalized so that the word gay is synonymous with the word bad, because then he will pick that up. And it's probably a man of 50 or a woman of 48 who has used that word and normalized it because they will be the people who are running the kart team, the go-kart team. So Racing Pride tries to assist with that. And some people get impatient about it and say, don't worry about pronouns, don't worry about terminology, but I think it does matter because it influences people. And also at the other end of the age spectrum, there are people, usually again, gay men, but closeted gay men, hidden gay men, who might be mechanics or engineers who are working in Formula One and who started 15 or 20 years ago and are now in their 40s and who have always been secret because when they joined 15 or 20 years ago, whether they joined McLaren or Williams or Red Bull when it was called Stuart or Jaguar, um, and they felt they needed to be secretive back in those days and now feel that they would like to come out and perhaps tell their um, teammates, the other mechanics and engineers about their boyfriend or about their husband now. They may even be married, still in secret, married to a man. Oh my God. And they think I can't come out because my teammates will blame me for never having been honest over the past 15 or 20 years. So I think Racing Pride can help with that as well. And that's a particular area that I try to help with. And I have seen people come out uh, in their forties and, and I, it's not for me to influence somebody to come out or persuade them to come out because it's up to every individual in the world when or if they want to come out. But sometimes when somebody has rung me, perhaps number withheld, not telling me their name, not even telling me the team they work for, but saying, I work for a British Formula One team. Um, and they ask me about that and it's happened a few times and then I say well you know let's talk often and see if you want and we can talk this through whether you want to come out or how you want to come out or if or when and you might find this is what I usually say you might find that the mechanic or engineer fellow mechanic or engineer that you are dreading his reaction because perhaps you've um, roomed with him uh, for years, because often it was two mechanics to a room, not so much in COVID times, but it was before, or you have become mates with him or you've gone to pubs and bars with him and you've sat and worked out uh, um, complicated uh, strategies around um, tire, uh, stops if you're a race engineer, for instance, um, all these things, and you have these friends, professional friends, and perhaps the, 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 the colleague who you're terrified of his reaction may well reply and react like this. He may well say, oh, I'm just so relieved you finally told me. Of course, I always suspected it, and I always loved you like a friend anyway. And are you happy? Do you have a boyfriend? Yes. I'd love to meet him. Now, that is the kind of reaction that I have sometimes seen people who've been in the sport for many, many years experience. And it really is heartwarming when it happens. Yeah, I can imagine. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing like uh, that hurts me the most that there should be a come out because like if you're straight, you don't have to tell that I'm marrying a girl or a boy, but it's when the opposite, when there is uh, queer people that they have to tell, like they have to announce that, like for personally, like I don't like to talk about my relationship, my marriage all the time. Like I am that person, like that. That's that's my personal life, and I have to. I love to keep it in close. So it's it's hard, I think, to have to announce if you need to announce. But as you said, uh, it's not 
happening in one day everything is not changing in one day so in time maybe that that should be normalized uh, or i don't like the word normal but yeah no i take that i take what you mean i also think the thing that a lot of straight people don't realize is that if you are lgbtq plus you have to come out again and again and again yeah. it's not just you tell your mum and dad when you're 16 and now everything's fine no when you go to university, you have to come out again to everybody. When you go to your first job, you have to come out again. When you move into a new block of flats and you decide that you're going to have a wine and cheese party on um, before Christmas with all the other residents, you have to come out again. When you move to another job, you have to come out again. When all these things, you have to keep coming out. I, I keep coming out now, you know, because I don't mean I walk down the street telling people, by the way, mate, I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that, but in a new environment, I, I would, if, if we're suddenly talking about I'm getting to know somebody, I'll come out. And you, you keep doing it. And, and you have to keep doing it. That's the first thing I would say. Second thing I would say is that my personal belief, and I may be wrong, but I think it's the case, is that current 20 drivers in Formula One are all heterosexual men. That's my understanding. I may be wrong, but that's my understanding. And that's what they certainly present. But there may be a driver in the future, a Formula One driver, who's perhaps now in Formula Two or Formula Three or Formula Four or something else, who will come through and will be a gay man. Or, by the way, woman, but let's, let's, that's a separate subject. I'm talking about men at the moment because I think there is a possibility for women to enter Formula One, but the last one was 45 years ago, so let's not yeah. hold our breath. I do think it's possible and desirable, but I'm talking about men at the moment. So I think when if and or when that gay man arrives in Formula One, it is open because we have had three um, LGBTQ plus people in Formula One in history. One gay man, Mike Beutler, who raced in the early 70s and very sadly died of AIDS in Los Angeles in 1988, British guy. Uh, one bisexual uh, man, um, Nisha Cabral, and one lesbian, Lella Lombardi, Lella Lombardi. and they're all three dead. <clears throat> but out of 900 odd Formula One drivers, it's probably unlikely that they were the only three, but they're the only three we know about for, with any certitude. But if in the future, and it might be in one year or two years or four years or six years, I don't know, by chance there is a young gay man who comes to Formula One, particularly if he is successful, racing for a good team, scoring podium finishes and perhaps even wins. And he comes forward and says, yes, by the way, I do race for Ferrari or McLaren or Aston Martin or Red Bull or whatever. And I'm gay. This is my boyfriend. And I'm very pleased not only to have won the French Grand Prix for me and for my team, but also perhaps for LGBTQ plus young drivers, who are perhaps karting, or perhaps those who didn't enter this sport because they thought it wasn't for them. But I'm here to tell you that it is for you. And also for LGBTQ plus fans, I am with you. Now, some people belittle that kind of thing. I think it's wonderful. And there's a British diver who you must know of or oh, should cool. know of, yeah. Tom Daly. Tom Daly. Who did exactly that. And he came out, I don't know, about eight years ago and he won an Olympic gold medal in the very most recent Olympic Games. And he made a speech very like that. And not only is he a great role model and trailblazer in my view, but also he's revolutionized his sport because there were young men, I'm talking about 13, 14 year olds who were deciding what sport, perhaps they were good at diving, perhaps they were good at swimming, perhaps they might've wanted to be a footballer or in our country, a cricketer or whatever, I don't know. But they saw Tom Daly and they went, I can do that. Yes, I'm a gay boy, but I can do that because yeah. he's proven that you can. And now, that's eight years ago he came out, now quite a lot of young male divers are gay. Why is that? It's because young boys who realized they were gay, but knew they were athletic and wanted to have a career in sport, thought, I can do that. And they didn't say I can do motor racing yet, but I hope one day they will. Yeah, exactly. Like I can remember like 
while I was in, watching Tom Daly, the time that he didn't come out, but he was, I, I, I love watching Die Wink, by the way, it's a really nice sport. And he was a really kind little kid back then. And now he turns into something else, as you said, as a role model. And I think, I believe Hamilton and Fatal are at that kind of Each level. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember like the time that Vettel came out in Turkish Grand Prix in 2020 with his helmet on, with diversity helmet. I love that because it was in Turkey and all the stuff is happening in women rights, LGBTQ plus rights. And it was really important for me to person like him going out, saying out loud, even though he has all the privilege in the Germany, he just left that. He just said, okay, I have the privilege, but I have a voice also. That's, I believe Hamilton is doing the same thing right now. They're both doing the same. They're both doing the same. And, and Sebastian, who I work with, I worked with Lewis for five years. Yeah. And I work with Sebastian now. And, you know, I, I'm enormously proud and privileged to have worked with the one and now to be working with the other. Uh, but as you say, that was a wonderful thing that Seb did last year in Turkey. And then this year, you know, he did it again in Hungary. Yeah. <clears throat> and then in the very, you know, last two races, uh, Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi, where yeah, life for LGBT. Karting. Yes, uh, the women's karting, as you say, in Saudi Arabia, which was a fantastic initiative. And, you know, both those countries are not optimal for LGBTQ plus people, but he wore his famous sneakers with the rainbow stripes yeah. and, he, uh, and again you might say that's just you know that's a, a symbol but it is literally walking the walk they are on his feet he is walking the walk and for someone like him who is of course heterosexual a father a husband um three children to do that we call being an ally and powerful allies are extremely important just as important actually as the role models and trailblazers. So I would put Sebastian Vettel and Tom Daly, although one is straight and the other is gay, I'd make them both absolutely important LGBTQ plus um, pioneers. And Lewis Hamilton as well, with obviously his end racism and Black Lives Matter, but also the things he's done for LGBTQ plus and for diversity and inclusion in general. All of them great people. Yeah, exactly. And I I love both like Aston Martin and Mercedes for those allowing those initiatives because it's still a hard thing to do in this environment. So it's it's really inspiring, even though like uh, I, I consider myself a lie also. So um, it's nice for them to have that kind of voice because uh, they have it. They have they, they can be so loud. So it's important to change the face of the sport. I completely agree. I, mean, I, I can think of um, uh, fans who have written to me, including young fans, you know, 13, 14, 15, straight boys who have written saying it's so good what you're doing with Sebastian and Aston Martin and Racing Pride, because as you know, Racing Pride is a partner mm. of Aston Martin now. And for me to imagine that a 13 or 14 or 15 year old boy or girl who is straight is impressed by that kind of ally and that kind of activation makes me realize and feel confident about the future that perhaps well at least in some parts of the world the problems are beginning to melt away yeah and lastly while we talk about children the boys and girls uh, that maybe about to enter the sport as a driver or uh, maybe someone who wants to work in this environment. I want to ask you last bit of advice for them. What would you say maybe to little Matt? What would you say right now if you have the chance to talk with them? Well, I've already said that one of my mottos um, or maxims in life is um, if in doubt, say yes. And what I mean by that is, you, you know, I don't mean say yes to everything. I don't mean say yes if somebody has a very stupid idea. If somebody says, please help me commit this crime, then no, <laughs> you must say no to that. 
but that is because you shouldn't be in doubt anyway. Um, what I'm talking about is if in doubt. So if somebody says, Pina, I'm offering you this job, but it's in Sweden. This is, I'm afraid, an imaginary idea, but just imagine. Or it's in the United States of America, or it's in London, UK. And you think, ooh, should I do that? Should I do that? I will miss home, blah, blah, blah. And you're thinking about it. My advice is to say yes to these opportunities. Say yes. You will therefore make some mistakes, but you're gonna make mistakes in life anyway. We are on this planet for 70 or 80 years, hopefully, um, and we will make some mistakes. But if you approach every time you're in two minds by saying yes rather than saying no, I think that probably you will end up having a more successful and more fun and more beneficial to your fellow man and woman life than if you say, mm, maybe not, maybe I stay home. And I'm not just talking about taking jobs in different parts of the world, I'm talking about anything. Um, if in doubt, say yes. That's the first thing. The second one is live and let live. And what I mean by that is live and let live. So four words, which are so full of meaning, those four words. Live, that means live, actually live, live your life, do what you want to do. Um, chase the dreams that you want to achieve. Live. Find the friends that you want to be friends with and then cultivate them and, uh, and befriend them and, and love them. Um, do everything that you want to do. Search for those things. Search for them energetically. Live. And then the other three words, and let live. That means allow other people to do exactly the same. And if you don't particularly sympathize or empathize with their religion or their politics or their choice of sexual or uh, partners because by the way we don't choose our sexual orientation but we do choose our sexual partners or at least we have the right to and always must have the right to if you don't agree with all those things live and let live let them do them their thing and you know i i found this uh, on twitter i find this on twitter where you know i live uh, in a nice part of london and I never physically encounter homophobia. Nobody shouts abuse at me in the street in the nice part of London in which I live. Even if I walk down uh, the street um, holding the hand of my beloved husband, Angel, and I will do that and I defend my right to do that, but nobody shouts abuse to me in the street. They did do 25 years ago, different partner, but if they did do 25 years ago, things have improved. Yeah. But obviously, I realize there are parts of the world in which you can't do that. And by the way, I still get homophobic abuse on Twitter. It still sometimes surprises me that I would write a tweet saying, on this day, um, Mike Beutler was born. And then I write a little bit of history about Mike Beutler. And then I would record that he passed away in 1988 in Los Angeles, died of AIDS. Um, and then I might easily get a reply from someone, and I'm not gonna use a bad word, but just saying something very abusive to me personally. And I think, isn't that strange? But it still exists, it still happens. So live and let live, that's all I can say. And then it, in terms of the final comment, because you did, get me on your show in order to say, can I give advice to people, young people who are entering Formula One? Obviously, I'm not um, a, a, an engineer or an aerodynamicist or a mechanic, and those are still the jobs that are most numerous in Formula One teams. So do as I say, not as I do, study at school, uh, if you find that you are good at those kind of subjects, study very, very hard and don't underestimate your opportunity. You know, if you are good at maths, if you are good at science at school and you are in love with Formula One or in motorsport generally, and somebody's got to do those jobs, why shouldn't it be you? Yeah. And if you're not into science or maths, 
I'm, I'm not really, I mean, I'm not gifted, then, um, then there's always a possibility to find a way. Never underestimate yourself. I think I did when I was very young. I didn't realize that, um, and I'm nothing special, but nobody is special. Everybody is special. And uh, I would say, therefore, make the effort. If you, if you really work hard, it's surprising how many doors do spring open for you. So that's my message. I love it. I mean, I will keep in mind from personally live and let live. That's, that's, that's really amazing. I, I feel goosebumps right now. And thank you for your time. It was a privilege for me. And what I say for Hamilton, for Fatal, it based on you also, I think you're changing the part of the sport. It's really important. And uh, it's, it's really nice to, it's nice to have this kind of chance to witness that from outside of you. Uh, thank you for that also. And uh, thank you for watching guys. And please like the video and ask your questions uh, or comment down below, whatever you want. Don't uh, bully please <laughs> um, but don't forget subscribe to my channel also thank you again matt it's it's it was a privilege for me to have this interview it was a privilege and a pleasure for me pinar too and please do subscribe to pinar's channel and pinar this you, you may think that i'm doing you a favor i don't see it that way at all you're doing me a favor for me aged 59 to be able to talk to an influencer of your age and to be able to help um, you and perhaps you help spread some of the lessons that I've learned over a long career. That is my privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye, guys.